we're going to be, if you really ask me what this chapter is about, it's about, actually I better change the paint color here. Uh, it's about understanding how uh, chemical equations work. So let's just write a chemical equation. Uh, hydrogen reacts with oxygen to form uh, water. All right, the foundation of chemistry is matter cannot be created or destroyed in a chemical reaction. And so um, the way I've got this equation written right now, it looks like an oxygen atom has disappeared. It's been destroyed because on the product side, we only have one oxygen, but on the reactant side, we have two oxygens. So again, to the left is called reactants. Oh, let me just write that down here. These are called the reactants. This is called the chemical yield sign. And to the right of the uh, chemical yield sign is called the products. And again, back to Dalton's atomic theory, he says that matter cannot be created or destroyed in a chemical reaction. So we have to balance this equation. That means all matter is accounted for on both the reactant side and the product side. So when you go to balance a chemical equation, you generally look at the product or the most complex substances in your chemical equation. This is the most complex because it consists of not only hydrogen but also oxygen. So I would focus on this when I'm going to balance a chemical equation. So I look and I have two hydrogens here on the product side and I've got two hydrogens here on the reactant side. And remember the subscript 2, what it means is that a hydrogen is bonded to another hydrogen. Just like the oxygen here, if we do a Lewis structure for it, it's an oxygen double bonded to another oxygen like that. And that's what the, oops, I don't have a correct, oops, let me fix that one. The Lewis structure for oxygen looks like this. Oxygen double bonded to another one, and then there's two sets of unpaired electrons, or non-bonding electrons on the, um, on the oxygen. All right, so to balance this, uh, we only see one oxygen here. Now, I can't put a 2 here. If I put a 2 here, that changes the compound. It's no longer water. It's uh, hydrogen peroxide. So you can't change the, uh, you can't just put a subscript there. So the only thing you can do is put a coefficient, that's what that's called, in front of the water. And that tells us now that we have 2 times 2, 4 hydrogen on the product side, and 2 times 1. Uh, two oxygen on the product side. So that helps us because now we have two oxygen on the product side and we have two oxygen in the form of a molecule bonded together on the reactant side. So by putting this coefficient of two in front of the water though, I now have four hydrogen on the product side. So I need to put a two in front of the hydrogen here to get four hydrogen on the reactant side. So the last check is to go through it, make sure that you have the same number of atoms on both sides. So two times two, you've got four hydrogen on the reactant side, you've got two oxygen on the reactant side, and uh, you've got four hydrogen on the product side, and you've got two times one, two oxygen on the product side, so everything is balanced. Mom, just add an extra oxygen one. Like this? Or did you say add another one like that? Just another one like that? Yeah. Well, you'd have to have a... So is this oxygen bonded to the water or is it separate from the water? Uh, if it was separate, so you'd have a plus sign like that. Um, it, first of all, oxygen would not to be unpaired. It's, it's, it's highly reactive. So you're on you're onto something there. The oxygen, I mean, what happens here is the hydrogen collides with the oxygen and breaks that bond. So one oxygen's looking for something to bond to, it bonds to two hydrogen, that makes one water. Well, this other oxygen's looking for hydrogen to bond to something too to make another water. So we wouldn't have just a three atom of oxygen, it would be highly reactive. So in the end, what happens is 
the, the oxygen finds some more hydrogen and forms the compound water. All right? Other questions? All right. Uh, Let's, let's do another balance in a chemical reaction, a little bit more complex than this one. Let's say that um, I want to bond uh, aluminum uh, sulfate with, uh, bar uh, no, let's say, sodium hydroxide. All right, aluminum sulfate, sodium hydroxide. Now, you may be asking, how do we come up with this chemical formula for aluminum sulfate? Well, this is what we learned in the last chapter, that this is a, a metal with a polyatomic ion, and that the aluminum is a three positive ion, and the sulfate's a polyatomic ion with a negative two charge. So both three positive and two negative go into six, so I've got to have two aluminum three positives, and three sulfate polyatomic ions, which are two negative, to have a neutral compound. All right, so that's how I know the chemical formula for aluminum sulfate. The sodium hydroxide, uh, again, sodium is out of group one. It's a metal. It forms a positive one ion, and the hydroxide ion is a polyatomic ion with a negative one charge, or one negative charge. Let me say one negative. All right, so that's how I know sodium hydroxide is NaOH. So if new products are going to be formed, light charges repel each other, so there is no way the aluminum is going to react with the sodium ion. Aluminum is a three positive ion, sodium is a positive ion, they do not react. Light charges repel each other. Same thing for the sulfate ion is not going to react with the hydroxide ion because, again, light charges repel each other. So the only thing new that could form is the sodium could react with the sulfate. All right, if that happened, what would be the chemical formula for sodium sulfate? How many sodiums would have to bond to the sulfate? How many? Twelve? How many? Two is right. Two is right. Why do we get two? Well, sodium's a positive one ion. Sulfate's a negative two ion. So you've got to have two positive one sodiums to bond with that one negative two sulfate. All right? Sodium's positive one. Sulfate's a negative two. Therefore, it's got to be two sodiums for every one sulfate to form a neutral compound. All right? Let's see if I can erase this without getting. All right? Let's do that one. All right, so what's the other compound that's going to be formed? Aluminum is going to bond with the hydroxide. What's the chemical formula for aluminum hydroxide? Al. Parenthesis, how many OHs? Three. That's right. So some of you may be asking me, what, why, when do we use a parenthesis? Anytime you have more than one of a polyatomic ion, you have to put the polyatomic ion in the parentheses. Now, for sodium hydroxide, we only have one polyatomic ion, so we don't use a parenthesis there. But for the sulfate where we have three, or the hydroxide over here where we have three, you have to put the polyatomic ion in parentheses, and then outside the parentheses is a subscript. Tell the person how many of those are attached. All right? Questions on how we came up with the products here. Now this is where it gets hard because this builds on chapter 3. If you don't know aluminum's a 3 positive ion, or sulfate's 2 negative, or hydroxide's negative 1, you're not going to have a clue as to how to write your, your equation here. So that's why it's important that if you haven't memorized those polyatomic ions, you get some 3 by 5 note cards and put the ion on one side and the name on the other, so you can write these equations. All right, now, is this equation balanced or is it unbalanced? It's unbalanced. So I would probably look at these two substances over here as a product. So the first thing I notice is that um, I've got two sodium here. I only have one here, so I know to put at least a two there. 
All right. Uh, I have one sulfate here. I have three over here. Now I can't change that three, so I'm going to have to put a three here in front of the sulfate, sodium sulfate. So what's that do to my sodiums now? How many sodiums do I have on the uh, ions do I have on the product side? Six. So I'm going to have to change this to a six. All right. And that's the way it works. You kind of go back and forth, back and forth until everything is balanced. All right. So now I have three sulfates, and there's three sulfates on the reactant side and three times one, three sulfates on the product side. I have six sodium on the product side, and I have six sodium on the reactant side. Now, uh, what number do I need to place in front of the aluminum hydroxide? So we'll put a coefficient of two in front of the aluminum hydroxide. That gives me two aluminums on both sides. And how many hydroxides do I have on both sides? Six, that's right. Two times three here, that's six. And six times one there, six there. And so my equation is balanced. Now, if you're having a really difficult time balancing an equation, I will, I, if I have a really difficult time break, uh, having a balancing equation, I'll start breaking it out into individual uh, atoms or ions. So there's two aluminum on the product side. There's two times one, two aluminums on the reactant side. Now the sulfate, because it's remaining intact from the reactant side to the product side, I will keep that intact over here when I'm balancing it. It's three sulfates, and over here we got three times one, three sulfates. And then six sodium and six hydroxide on the reactant side. And then over here we have three times two, six sodium, and uh, two times three, six hydroxide. So when you get really stuck, it is best to break it down into individual atoms or polyatomic ions if they remain intact to figure out if it's balanced or not. All right. Uh, let's see. Let's do one more. Questions on that one? All right. So the next one we'll do is let's take uh, butane. It's like in a butane lighter, and we're going to burn that in pure oxygen. And anytime you burn a, uh, anytime you burn a hydrocarbon, which is a carbon hydrogen based compound, in uh, pure oxygen. So here's butane. I don't expect you to write the chemical formula for butane. Uh, anytime you burn butane in oxygen. You get carbon dioxide and water. Carbon dioxide and water. Now you do need to know that. That anytime you burn a hydrocarbon, a carbon hydrogen based compound, in oxygen, carbon dioxide and water are your two products. Alright, so we want to balance this equation. So let's look at the carbon dioxide. What coefficient do I need to place in front of the carbon dioxide? Two. Four, all right? Four is right. Four carbons goes with the four carbons there. All right? Now, in this case, this is the last thing I would balance is the oxygen because it's all pure oxygen. So I'm going to worry about the oxygen last. All right? How many, uh, what coefficient do I need to place in front of the water? Five is correct. I'm going to put a five here. 5 times 2 gives me 10 hydrogen on the product side, and there's my 10 hydrogen on the reactant side. Now, what's my, here's where it gets a little difficult. What's the total number of oxygen on the product side? 13, that's right. 4 times 2 is 8, plus the 5 is 13 oxygen. All right? I have two oxygen on the reactant side. So this is when it gets difficult. You got an even number of oxygen on one side, and you got an odd number on the other side. Now, how do you change an, even, an odd number into an even number? Multiply by what? No, it's always two. Take any odd number, multiply by two, and it becomes even. All right? That's one way to think of it. Here's the easiest way, though. This is the easiest way to balance this equation. 
The first thing to do is write 13 halves here in, as your coefficient in front of the oxygen. You go, why do you do that? Well, this 2 cancels out with that 2, and I have 13 oxygen on both sides. That's the quickest way to balance the equation. Is it legal to do this? Absolutely. Does your book show you to do this? No, it does not. But that is the fastest way to balance a chemical equation where it's odd and even. Now, what your book would say to do, and this is, this is what most people would do as well, they don't like to have a fractional coefficient. So what would you multiply this entire equation by to get rid of this 2 in the denominator? 2, all right? So that would give us 2C4H10 plus this 2 times 13 has gives me 13 oxygens. 2 times 4 is 8 CO2s and 2 times 5 is 10 waters. All right? And yeah, my four doesn't look too hot there. Let's read that. There's eight carbon on both sides. Eight carbon there, eight carbon there. There's 20 hydrogens on the reactant side. And 10 times 2, there's 20 hydrogen on the product side. There's 26 oxygens on the reactant side. And we got 8 times 2, 16 plus 10, 26 oxygen on both sides. One other thing to remember when you balance a chemical equation, the coefficients, if there's no fraction, the coefficients got to be the, in the simplest whole numbers. The simplest whole numbers. So if you said my balance came out, chemical equation came out to be 4 butanes plus um, 26 oxygens, yield 16 carbon dioxide plus, um, oops, I did like 8 carbon dioxide. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to do this in my head. 8 carbon dioxide plus 10 waters. This equation would be incorrect because every one of these numbers could be divided by 2 and give you a whole number. So your balanced chemical equation should be in the simplest whole number ratio or you can have one fractional co one or two fractional coefficients but for chemistry 140 they're all going to be in simplest whole number ratios and the problem with 4 26 8 and 10 everything can be divided by 2 and still give you a whole number ratio in fact that's what we have right here the simplest whole number ratio yeah well, when we were back up here, you went 4 times 2, that's 8, plus the 5 there is 13 oxygen, right? 4 times 2 is 8, plus 5 times 1, 13. All right? So we put a 13 halves here so that this 2 and that 2 would cancel out and that would give me 13 oxygens on the reactant side. That's the quick way to do it. Does that work for you? Okay. Other questions on this one? I mean, that's the simplest way. I mean, you don't have to do it that way, but this is the simplest way. So when you've got 13 oxygens on this side, and you've got an even number on this side, and you want to get rid of that too, and make it 13 oxygens, put 13 halves there, the twos cancel out, and that gives you 13 oxygen. That's the quickest way. Now, some of you say, well, I don't like working with the fraction. Well, that's okay. Then you're going to sit there and say, if I got an even number on one side and an odd number on the other side, at least multiply the entire equation by two. And that'll fix it. All right? All right. So that's all I really want to say about balancing chemical equations. You say, well, why do we need to work with balanced chemical equations? Again, the reason why we have to have a balanced chemical equation is to go back to the first uh, part of Dalton's law, which is matter cannot be created or destroyed in a chemical reaction, or the conservation of mass. All right, so we've got to prove to you that mass is not created or destroyed in a chemical reaction. So watch what happens with our water here. We got 
based on our last chapter, we can do the Lewis structures for these two hydrogen molecules. And we can do the Lewis structure for this water molecule. And that's going to form two waters, like so. Okay, so visually here we can see there's four hydrogens on the reactant side, there's four hydrogens on the product side. There's two oxygen on the reactant side, and there's two oxygen on the product side. This really doesn't do us much good because when you're in the lab, you don't, when we're mixing chemicals together, we generally weigh those things out. So we've got to get from some visual model to some mathematical model so we can compare uh, one substance to another. So in order to do that, we're going to have to talk about the masses of these, uh, these molecules. So what is the mass of one of these hydrogens? Diatomic hydrogens. How do we find it out? Well, if I'm trying to find out what the mass of one individual hydrogen molecule is, we call this formula mass. Or in some older books, they call it molecular mass because this is uh, a formula mass sometimes distinguishes ionic versus covalent. But uh, your book just calls it formula mass. But it can also be called molecular mass. Now, the way we find out this molecular mass is you look at the periodic table. So you're going to be looking at the periodic table a lot on this first exam. You go up to the periodic table and you look at hydrogen up there. And right below the hydrogen, in red there, is the atomic mass. All right, so um, let's see if we can get the laser working here. All right, so it's 1.00794. That's how much one atom of hydrogen weighs in atomic mass units. All right, so one hydrogen atom weighs 1.00794 atomic mass units. Now you say, how do we get this atomic mass unit? Where does it come from? Well, the definition of an atomic mass unit is that one atom of a particular isotope of carbon called carbon-12, and there's the isotopic symbol for carbon-12, weighs exactly 12.00 out to infinity here, atomic mass units. That's the definition of an atomic mass unit. <laughs> So in this atom of carbon-12, these are the things you ought to be able to tell me right now. How many protons in an atom of carbon-12? Six protons. How many neutrons in an atom of carbon-12? Six neutrons. So what we end up saying here is that each individual proton and each individual neutron, because they weigh approximately the same amount to three significant figures, we say that a proton weighs approximately one atomic mass unit, and we say a neutron weighs one atomic mass unit. So every individual proton and every individual neutron has an approximate mass of one atomic mass unit. You go, what does that do for me? Well, what was the most common isotope of hydrogen? It was hydrogen one that only has one proton. So that's why its average atomic mass up here is pretty close to one point, it's pretty close to one, right? It's 1.00794. So to two significant figures, it is 1.0. So this hydrogen weighs 1.00794. Do I need to write all those digits down? No, you decide where you're going to round off. Maybe you only need three significant figures. So one atom of hydrogen to three significant figures weighs 1.01 atomic mass units. All right, how much does one atom of uh, sulfur weigh? To three significant figures. Thirty-two point one. Thirty-two point one atomic mass units. All right. So that's called formula mass. The problem with formula mass is it's only for individual atoms or molecules. And when you're working in the lab or anything you see in this room, we're not dealing with individual atoms and molecules. 
we're dealing with a large quantity of atoms and molecules. So nobody wants to work with these AMUs very often, especially if you're in the lab, because the quantity that we work in th with in the lab as far as mass goes is grams. So we have to work with a quantity that we can see, that we can manipulate, and that quantity is called a mole, one mole. M-O-L-E, mole. And a mole is equal to Avogadro's number, which is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. And you're going to need to know that number. Avogadro's number. In fact, you need to memorize this equality. One mole is equal to 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Now, most chemists don't say one mole equals 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. It's too long. They say one mole equals Avogadro's number. And when people hear the word Avogadro's number, they know it's 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. You say, well, what does that do for me? Well, watch what happens. When I have a mole of hydrogen, individual hydrogen atoms, a mole of hydrogen, that means I have Avogadro's number of hydrogen atoms, the mass of that one mole of hydrogen to three significant figures is 1.01 grams. So you say, well, over here is 1.01 atomic mass units for one atom of hydrogen. Notice the numbers don't change, just the units. One atom of hydrogen, 1.01 .01 atomic mass units. One gram of hydrogen, or I mean one mole of hydrogen, 1.01 .01 grams. So when I have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd hydrogen atoms, I have a mass that I can see, that I can manipulate, that I could weigh out on a balance. That's why we like using moles and grams. One mole of sulfur becomes 32.1 grams. So it's the same numbers, different units. So anytime you see somebody describing something in terms of atomic mass units, they're talking about it in terms of a molecule or an atom. A molecule or a atom. When you see it described in moles or grams, we're talking about Avogadro's number worth of particles. Now I say particles because a mole, you can say I have a mole of eggs, I have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd eggs. You can say I have a mole of hydrogen atoms, I've got 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd hydrogen atoms. Or you can say I have one mole of hydrogen gas, and hydrogen gas is diatomic. It's not one hydrogen, it's two hydrogens bonded together. So that means I have one mole of hydrogen molecules. which would weigh how much? Yeah, there you go. 2.02 grams. Because it's not one hydrogen, it's diatomic hydrogen. Each hydrogen is 1.01 .01 grams per mole, but this is diatomic, H2. And when we talk about the hydrogen that is in the air, it is not individual hydrogens, which are highly reactive. It is molecules of hydrogen, H2. So some of you may be saying, well, which elements occur diatomically? Which atoms naturally occur as diatomic substances? Well, that's where this comes in. Here's the mnemonic. Han, yeah, that's it. Let me do my end over. Han, Cliff, Burr. These are the elements that naturally occur as diatomic molecules in nature. So what that means is that these all occur as H2, O2, N2, Cl2, I2, F2, Br2. So you need to memorize those because if they tell you one of these is a gas, or they're talking about it in general terms, they're expecting you to know this is diatomic. Unless they tell you it's monoatomic, you should assume it's diatomic, especially if they're talking about it in terms of a gas. Although, at room temperature, everything in black is a solid at room temperature, 
everything in red is a gas at room temperature, uh, and then blue is a liquid. So the iodine actually occurs as a diatomic solid, and the bromine actually occurs as a diatomic liquid. And then oxygen, diatomic gas, nitrogen, diatomic gas, hydrogen over here, diatomic gas. So keep that in mind that you're going to look at the periodic table and the colors are going to tell you something. Black is a solid at room temperature, red's a gas, and blue's a liquid. All right, so let's um, let's erase this. All right, so if I'm talking about individual um, atoms of um, hydrogen or molecules of hydrogen, what's the total mass of hydrogen I have on the reactant side of my equation here? That's right. And the way you would do that, mathematically, you would show it this way. You would say, I have two molecules of hydrogen. And you know that every one molecule of, oops, molecule of hydrogen weighs how much? 2.02. What's the units? AMU. Now it's AMU is for individual molecules. That's what's that's what's going to be key right here is that you know what they're talking about. AMUs. So we have 4.04 AMUs of diatomic hydrogen on the reactant side. That's what we have. 4.4 4.04 AMUs. Alright? We have one molecule of Oxygen. How much does one molecule of oxygen weigh? To three significant figures. But it's diatomic. 32.0. 32.0, what's the units? AMUs. So on the reactant side, we have 4.04 atomic mass units of hydrogen, 32.0 atomic mass units of oxygen. Now, if every bit of this is consumed, we would lose 36.04, and again, we're, we're not worried about the significant figures really at this point, but we'll keep that in mind. Really, we only know this to the tenth place. We're adding these two things. This is only known to the tenth place. We would lose 36.04 AMUs of material. All right, if all the hydrogen and all of the oxygen on the reactant side is used up, consumed, we lost 36.04 atomic mass units. So if it's all consumed on the reactant side, 36.04 atomic mass units, how much mass better show up on the product side? That's right, 36.04, because again, the foundation of chemistry is matter cannot be created or destroyed in chemical reaction. So, let's figure out how much water weighs, all right? So, if I have a water molecule, I have two atoms of hydrogen, and I have one atom of oxygen. All right, how much does one atom of hydrogen weigh? 1.01 what? AMUs, because we're talking about individual atoms. 1.01 AMUs. How much does one atom of oxygen weigh? That's right. This is one atom. This isn't diatomic. This is one. 16 AMUs. 16.0 AMUs. All right? So 2 times 1.01 gives me 2.02 .02 AMUs. We add to that 16, and what do we get? 18.02 AMUs. 2 times 1.01 .01 gives me 2.02. .02. 1 times 16 gives me 16.0. Add those together, we get 18.02 AMUs.
So what we've just done is let me erase this. We got some room here. Is we have found out that one molecule of water weighs how much? 18.02 AMUs. Okay, we're going to use that to determine how much water would be formed. How many water molecules according to our balanced chemical equation is formed? Two. Two water molecules. If I take that and I multiply it, I, here's where all the math, I said all the math from chapter one is right there. It does it for the rest of us, for the rest of chemistry 140. From this equality, you make a conversion factor. You take the 18.02 AMUs, put it in the numerator, because that's what you're trying to find out. You put the one molecule of water in the denominator. All right? The water molecules cancel out here, and I get 2 times 18.02, and what's that give me for an answer? 36.04. 36.04, and we have just proved that matter is not created or destroyed in a chemical reaction. That we had 4.04 .04 AMUs of hydrogen. We had 32.0 AMUs of oxygen. If this is all consumed, that means there should be, we lose all 4.04 .04 of this. Oops. And we lose all 32 of this. We better gain over here 32.04. 32.04 AMUs over on this side, and we did. Or, I mean, 36, yeah. 36.04. All right? It's what a balanced chemical equation does for us. It shows us what happens with the matter. Now, you're going, well, why are we doing this in AMUs? We can't wave AMUs out. All right, so I agree with that. So we could do these same calculations in terms of grams, right? This would become 4.04 .04 grams. Now we're talking about instead of two molecules of hydrogen, we're talking about two moles of hydrogen. Two moles of hydrogen weigh 4.04 .04 grams. How much does one mole of oxygen weigh? Do I? But it's O2, right? So you got to multiply. Yeah, 32. 32.0 grams. Up here, let me, since we've got this up here, I can fix this, right? If I want to know how much one mole of water weighs, one mole of water means I have two moles of hydrogen, and I have one mole of oxygen. So all I'm doing is changing from atoms to moles, and one mole of hydrogen weighs how much? That's right, 1.01 grams. So the AMUs are gone because we're talking about a mole of hydrogen. Same thing here. This becomes a mole of oxygen. It weighs 16 grams per mole, so the grams go here. And this now becomes 18.02 grams. So one mole of oxygen, of, of water, weighs 18.02 grams. And so down here, instead of saying two water molecules, we would say two moles of water. And two moles of water would mean one mo instead of molecule it would be one mole of water, and instead of being 18.02 grams, I mean 18.02 AMUs, it would be 18.02 grams, and this becomes 36.04 grams. So the reason why I'm doing that is just to show you uh, we use the same numbers. We generally move to the realm of moles, Avogadro's number worth of particles. So we can get masses and grams that we can weigh out on a balance in the lab. We can manipulate. We can see it. 18 uh, or 36 grams of water is pretty close to 36 milliliters of water. That's a quantity you can put in a graduated cylinder. You can read it. You can pour it out into a beaker. Whereas if we said two water molecules, you can't even see those under a microscope, right? Couldn't manipulate those. So, most of the time we are working in the realm of grains. You say, what am I supposed to do with all this? Well, this is where we're leading with this. Um, most of the time it doesn't work out nice and easy like this. That all the reactants consume and all of its formed as product. 
What more than likely happens when you're in the lab is you write your Bounds chemical equation. Uh, two moles of hydrogen react with one mole of oxygen to form two moles of water. And we start saying questions like this. Um, if 42 grams of water is formed, how many moles of hydrogen, or how many grams of hydrogen is required? If 42 grams of water is formed, how many grams of hydrogen would be required? All right, and you go, well, I don't know where to start this problem. Because in reality, it's not about mass, because hydrogen weighs a different amount than oxygen. So it's really hard just to look, like I can't look at this problem right now and tell you how many grams of hydrogen is going to be required. Because hydrogen weighs a different amount than water. You all would agree this, that one mole of hydrogen individual or diatomic hydrogen, let's do that. One mole of diatomic hydrogen weighs 4.04 .04 grams. How much does one mole of water weigh? 18, yeah, 18.02 grams. So water's heavier than hydrogen. So Here's the question. If I have 4.04 .04 grams of hydrogen and water, do I have the same number of molecules of each? Which one do I have more molecules of? Hydrogen. That's right. It takes more of those light hydrogen uh, molecules to make up a mole. Uh, to make up, not a mole, to make up the mass, right? Well, let's do it another way. Let's do it this way. How about that? I got 1,000 grams of hydrogen and I've got a thousand grams of water. Which one of those uh, substances do I have more molecules of? Hydrogen. hydrogen. That's right. It takes more hydrogen molecules to make a thousand grams because they're lighter to begin with. So it's hard for me to look at this problem and go, well, I don't know, I can't tell you by looking at this problem how many grams of hydrogen is required to make 42 grams of water. I think it's going to be quite a bit, though, don't you? Because that hydrogen uh, weighs less than the water does. All right, so how do we figure this out? How do we figure the problem out? Well, we start with what's given. Write down your 42 grams of water. All right, these coefficients in front of the balanced chemical equation say this to us, two moles of hydrogen react with one mole of oxygen to form two moles of water. So we need to convert the grams into moles because it's not saying two grams of hydrogen react with one gram of oxygen to form two grams of water. It's saying two moles. So we got to convert grams, and I'll, this is what I'm going to call it. I'm going to call it grams of A you put in whatever you want there. In this case, it's water. We're going to convert grams of A to moles of A. How do we do that? What do we use to convert grams to moles? Molar mass. All right? So what molar mass is, is we have to find out how much does one mole of water weigh. And we've already done that. How much does one mole of water weigh? That's right, 18.02 grams. It's two, it's 2 times 1.01, .01, which is 2.02 .02 grams, and 16 for the oxygen, 18.02 grams. So here's our first conversion factor. We want to get rid of the grams of water, and we want to have moles of water. So that when we get through this step up here, we've converted from grams of water to moles of water. So why do I need to divide both sides of my equality by to get that conversion factor? How do I transform this into that? All right, so that's what you do. 18, this is why I said if you can handle, this is what we did when we were doing conversions in chapter one. I said if you can handle this math, you can handle the math of chemistry 140. So that's the way it starts is you've got your plan of action up here, which is super important. 
you come up with your equality. One mole of water is 18.02 grams, and from this equality, you make conversion factors. Now, you can either divide both sides by 18.02 grams, or you can divide both sides by one mole of H2O, but the one we want is one with the grams in the denominator. This side becomes one. That tells me this is a true conversion factor. So for right here, I'm going to put 18.02 grams in the denominator and one mole of water in the numerator. I know I've set this up right because the grams of water cancel out. And now I'm left with moles of water. All right? The next step, let me erase this because we'll have to have some room here. The next step is now we know how many moles of water is 42 grams of water. We can now relate moles of water to moles of hydrogen. What is the relationship between moles of water and moles of hydrogen in our balanced chemical equation? For every two moles of water formed, how many moles of hydrogen had to be consumed? No, two moles of diatomic hydrogen. You don't break it down into four. It's, two, it's a two to two, right? For every two moles of water, for every two moles of water formed, that's why these coefficients become really important. <coughs> Two moles of diatomic hydrogen is required. That's the way, you don't want to break it down and say four. You want to keep it intact as 2H2. All right? So our plan of action is to go from moles of water to moles of hydrogen. So I'll tell you what. Let's just fix this. since it, This was grams of water we started with. We convert that to moles of water. Now we're going to convert it to moles of hydrogen. All right, so what do I need to divide both sides of this equality by to get a conversion factor that will convert moles of water to moles of hydrogen? Which, what do I need to divide both sides of that equality? Yeah, so you divide both sides of the equality by two moles of water. This side becomes one, there's your conversion factor there. So you're going to put a multiplication sign here, you're going to put a quotient bar, and you're going to move this over here, two moles of water over, uh, and then two moles of hydrogen in the numerator, two moles of hydrogen. All right. Where did this relationship come from to make this particular conversion factor? It always comes from when you're going from moles of water to moles of hydrogen or moles of one substance to moles of another, it always comes from the balanced chemical equation. Always. That's why you have to learn how to balance a chemical equation in order to do this problem. All right. It's for every two moles of water, we needed two moles of hydrogen, and there's the equality right there. And we make the conversion factor here. All right, so we're going to erase that. Now, the last step is we can convert from moles of hydrogen to grams of hydrogen. What do we have to know in order to convert from moles of hydrogen to grams of hydrogen? One mole of hydrogen weighs how much? Oh, but this is diatomic. That's right. One mole of hydrogen weighs 2.02 grams of diatomic hydrogen. So we got our next conversion factor. What's going to be in the denominator of our next conversion factor? That's right. Moles of H2. What's going to be in the numerator? Grams of H2, because that's what we're trying to get to. That's what our question was. How many grams of H2 is required to make 42 grams of water? So what are we going to divide both sides of our equality by? Yeah, one mole of H2. See, that's why I kept saying in Chapter 1 that you got to get this equality stuff down and the conversion factor, and that's why I spent the time doing it, because... Once you get the system down, it applies throughout Chemistry 140. 
So this side becomes one. That tells you that's a true conversion factor. And you're going to move that up here. It's going to be 2.02 grams over one mole. All right, so we're ready to, let's make sure all the units cancel out. Grams of water divide out here. Moles of hydrogen of water cancel out there. Moles of hydrogen cancel out there. The only unit left standing is grams of hydrogen. So now I know that when I calculate this out, I want to find out the answer. So you get your calculator out. And you're going to say... 42 divided by 18.02. And what's 2 divided by 2? It's 1, so I'm not even going to multiply by 1. This is 1, the non so I'm going to multiply by the 2.02 here. And I get 4.7 grams of hydrogen. four point seven grams of hydrogen. Now does that sound like a reasonable answer? Here's the way to check to see if you're on track or not. Forty two grams of water is approximately how many moles of water? Just roughly. Is it a little more than two moles of water? Is it is it three moles of water? No, what's three moles of water? How much would three moles of water weigh? Approximately. 48. This is 42. So we're not up to three moles of water, right? We've got a little bit more than two moles. So we need a little bit more than two moles of hydrogen there. Is 4.7 a little more than two moles of hydrogen? Diatomic hydrogen? Yeah. So that, get, that tells us that that's the right answer. That's a kind of a way to check. Now, if you're not getting that, I'm not too worried yet. I'm, not, I'm more worried if you can set this problem up like this. All right? But there is ways to approximate. Like, I know my answer, since I have less than uh, three moles of water, pretty close, a little bit more than two moles of water here, I better have a little bit more than two moles of hydrogen here because it's at one-to-one -one ratio between these two things. So, yeah, I do have a little bit more than two moles of hydrogen here. All right, let's do this problem again. This time, we're going to keep the same number. We're going to keep the same number... 42 grams of water, but now the question is, how many grams of oxygen is required? How many grams of oxygen is required to make 42 grams of water? So instead of this being the question mark, this is the question mark. How many grams of oxygen? All right. So, first problem is the first part is exactly the same. We start off with grams of water. How many we have? We have 42 grams. Now, let me just say something. Maybe this helps you a little bit. If you cook at home, this is no nothing different than this. The chemical equation is your recipe. The chemical equation is your recipe. When you open up a cookbook and it says two eggs and three cups of flour and a half cup of milk makes a loaf of bread, that's your, the, the eggs, the flour, and the milk are your reactants. The loaf of bread is your product. And the, and the recipe is your balanced chemical equation. The 42 grams here is what you actually make. How much you actually make? Do you make a loaf and a half or you just make one loaf? Or, generally you don't make a loaf. It's either you make a loaf or you don't. So you're either going to make 42 grams of water or you're not. And then the amount of oxygen required to make that 42 grams is what you have on hand. Do you have enough oxygen to make that H2O? So that's what we're trying to figure out here. We're going to make 42 grams of water. That's our product. How many grams of H2O do I have to get out of the cabinet 
so that when I react it with as much hydrogen as I need, then I'm going to form 42 grams of water. So in this case, we're assuming we've got all the hydrogen we need. Like we've got all the flour we need to make this loaf of bread, but the limiting reactant's the oxygen. All right? So the first thing we have to do is the same process up here. We've got to convert the grams of H2O to moles of H2O. So the first thing to do is make sure you label everything very carefully. 42 grams of H2O. First step is to convert the grams of H2O to moles of H2O. All right? And the way we do that is we know that the molar mass of water, one mole of H2O, looking at the periodic table, weighs 18.02 grams. That's my quality. You go, how'd you get this again? How'd you get this number? I break this down and say for every one mole of H2O, I've got two, two moles of hydrogen. And I have one mole of oxygen. And then I go to the periodic table and I say hydrogen weighs 1.01 grams per mole. And oxygen over there weighs 16.0 grams per mole. So 1.01 times 2 is 2.02. .02. Add 16 to it and I get that number there. That's where that comes from. You have to look at the periodic table. So why do I need to divide both sides of this equality by to get that conversion factor? That's right. 18.02 grams, both sides. And you go, how do you know that? Well, the grams need to be in the denominator, so it cancels out with these grams over here in the numerator. That's how I know to divide both sides by 18.02. This side becomes 1. That tells me this is a true conversion factor. And I have one mole of H2O over 18.02 grams. The grams are going to cancel out. That's what we want to happen. We're trying to go from grams of H2O to moles of H2O. All right, so step, no, step one is complete. That's what this arrow right here represents, step number one. All right, here's the tricky step, and this is the hardest step, actually. When I see quizzes and exams, this is the hardest step right here. To convert from moles of H2O instead of moles of hydrogen now, it's moles of oxygen. That's what we're interested in finding out. What is the mole-to-mole -mole ratio between moles of water and moles of, of oxygen? Yeah, for every two moles of... Yeah, let me write that down. For every two moles of water, how many moles of oxygen do I need? One. One. One mole of oxygen. Here it is. For every two moles of hydrogen, I need one mole of oxygen. So the, mole, the relationship between the substance you have and the substance you're trying to get to always comes from the balanced chemical equation. Always. So that's why we had to learn how to balance a chemical equation. We look up here. For every two waters formed, one oxygen is required. So right there it is. Two moles of H2O equals one mole of oxygen. So, what are we going to divide this equality by to convert water to oxygen? What are you going to divide both sides by? Two moles of water. Two moles of water. Whatever you divide one side of the equation by, you've got to divide the other side by. Otherwise, it's still not, it wouldn't be equal, right? This side becomes 1, and there's my conversion factor right there. All right, write that down because we're running out of space here. I'll, I'll tell you what, let me just clean this up a little bit and I'll put it in here. All right, so our, for our first conversion factor, we got 1 mole of H2O over 18.02 grams. All right, second conversion factor is this one. For every two moles of H2O in the denominator, that's what we want in the denominator so it'll cancel out with the moles of H2O here, we get one mole of oxygen. That's what we have right there. One mole of oxygen over two moles of H2O. Now, this conversion factor is so important, it's got its own name. It's called mole-to-mole -mole ratio. You need to know the terminology. It's called the mole-to-mole -mole ratio. 
And the mole-to-mole -mole ratio always comes from the balanced chemical equation. Always. So that's why we started this lecture with balancing the chemical equation. Because if you can't balance the chemical equation, you can't do this problem. Because if you don't get the equation balanced correctly up there, the rest of this falls apart. Alright? And, and for some reason, this is the most missed part of the problem right there. You would think it's the easy, everybody would get that step because you don't have to do any calculation. There's no molar mass calculation with the periodic table. But it's hard for students to remember that, hey, to get the mole-to-mole -mole ratio, I have to go back and look at my balanced chemical equation. All right, last step is we want to convert from moles of H2, moles of oxygen, moles of oxygen to grams of oxygen. So this is moles of oxygen, and we're trying to find out for our final answer how many grams of oxygen is required. So we have to find out the molar mass of oxygen. How much does one mole of O2 weigh? How much? No, it's 32. 32, because it's O2. You know, that, uh, the reason I'm on stressing that is because that is another one of the major mistakes on this. Most students, they'll be, I mean, even saying this today, there'll be a quarter of you miss this, but you're stressed out on a quiz or exam, but just be careful. If you write it out, you'll see this is O2, it's not O, it's O2. There's two oxygen bonded together, so it's 32 grams. And when you're doing this stuff on an exam, write your work out. I see so many students on the test, they're just on the calculator doing this. And then they look and they get the wrong answer from the multiple choice. And while they do, they start doing this again. If you keep doing that, you're, you're just repeating the mistake over and over. That's why you got to write this stuff out. Even on multiple choice, you got to treat it like it's not multiple choice and write out your plan of action like we have at the top up there. Write out your calculation. So that this is what happens. If you write it out, you get to this next conversion factor. And let's say you did say 16 grams of oxygen is one mole of O2. You would look at that and go, oh no, O2 is not 16, it's 32, and you would fix it, and you corrected the mistake. But if you don't write that out, if you're just punching on the calculator, you'll never catch that mistake, because you're not seeing it visually that this is O2. All right? So we took the equality, we divided both sides by one mole, and we got 32 over one mole there. Now, how do we know we set it up right? See, this is the whole thing. This is grams of H2O. They cancel out with the grams of H2O there. The moles of H2O cancel out here. And notice what this does, this mole-to-mole -mole ratio. It takes into account that for every two moles of water formed, only need one mole of oxygen, which that's what this says up here. We only need one mole of oxygen to form two moles of water, which makes sense because water only has one oxygen in its molecule. So this take, that's what the mole-to-mole -mole ratio does for you. It takes into account the relationship between the elements or molecules that uh, contribute to the compound. All right? And then the moles of O2 cancel out here. We're left with grams of O2. So we're going to multiply this out and find out how much oxygen is required. So take 42, divide it by the mass of the water, 18.02, divide by 2, the molar mole ratio, and then multiply by 32. And we get 37, rough answer, 37.29 grams of oxygen. All right, how many significant figures should we have? How many is in there? Two. This is all multiplication, so you should only have two in your final answer. So you look at the two, it's less than five, so my final answer would be 37 grams of O2. All right, let's do another one. Let's go back to the butane. No, let's do something different. We, we've done butane. Let's do a different. Let's say, um, let's look at methane. Is methane a good one? That's okay. So 
So methane's the major component of natural gas. So we got methane, burns, and oxygen. What's my two products? Anytime you burn a hydrocarbon in oxygen, water, CO2. You got to know that, water plus CO2. All right, so the first thing that you need to be able to do is you need to be able to balance this chemical equation. All right, so balance it. Tell me what coefficients I need. All right, so that's where I would start too. You need a 2 in front of the H2O, and you go, why? Well, you got four hydrogen here on the reacting side. You only had two in water here, so we put a coefficient of two in front of the H2O. That gives me four. All right? Now, that affects the number of oxygen on the product side. What's the total number of oxygen I have on the product side? Now? Four. How many do I have on the reacting side? So what are you going to put in front of the oxygen? All right. So is our equation balanced? All right. One carbon on both sides, four hydrogen on both sides, four oxygen on both sides. All right. So here's the question. I've got 100 grams of methane. Uh, let's, let's, make it a, let's make it 101 so we don't have to worry about significant figures. 101 grams of methane. I have all of the oxygen I need, so we're going to say an excess amount of oxygen. All the oxygen you need. It's like you've got all the flour to make that cake, but the limiting substance is going to be the milk. Here, you've got all the oxygen you need to burn this methane, but the limiting amount is the methane. And the question is, how many grams of CO2 is going to be formed? How many grams of CO2 is going to be formed? All right, got 101 grams of methane, all the oxygen that I need to consume all the methane, and I want to know how many grams of CO2 is going to be formed. These are the calculations that we, cal we do to calculate how much CO2 is released by natural gas to see how much it's going to contribute to global warming, which is caused by CO2. We want to know how much greenhouse gas, which is CO2, how much is going to be formed. All right, so here's the first step. you got to come up with your plan of action. That's the hardest part. Just like on this conversion problems, you've got to, you've got to come up with your plan. So what are we going to start with? That's right, we're going to start with that grams of methane because that's what's given. That's what's given in the problem. What are we going to convert the grams of methane to? Yeah, you got to convert it to moles. And again, the reasoning behind that is that that's the only way you can relate these substances to each other because that's what this, is, this balance equation is saying. It's saying for every one mole of methane, I require two moles of oxygen. That forms one mole of carbon dioxide and two moles of water. So I'm going to convert my grams of methane to moles of methane. Then what I'm going to convert to? That's right. Whatever you're trying to find out about. Moles of CO2 in this case. That's what we're trying to find out about. And then our last step, grams of CO2. Plan of action, most important step. Okay. Anytime you see where you have to convert grams to moles, you ought to be thinking, I've got to find the molar mass. The molar, how much does one mole of methane weigh? All right? So the three significant figures, tell me how much one mole of methane weighs. Sixteen point. How about 16.0? Is that right? To three? Or should I round? Let's see. 2.0. So it's 1.01 .01 times 4. 1.01 .01 times 4 plus 12.011. Yeah, 16. Point. Oh, it's right at it. 
It's 16.05. If you said 16.0, it's okay. I'll put a 16.1. All right. That's how much one mole of methane weighs. All right. So we start off with what's given, our 101 grams of methane. Uh, we're going to multiply that by, and we're going to put the 16.1 grams in the denominator and the one mole of methane in the numerator. Because that's what our plan of action tells us to do. It says we got to convert from grams to moles. And that's what we're doing here. The grams are going to cancel out. And that's going to give me moles of methane. All right? The next step is the mole to mole ratio. We're changing from moles of methane to moles of carbon dioxide. What's the relationship between moles of methane and carbon dioxide? One mole of methane generates how much carbon dioxide? One mole of carbon dioxide. Where do we get that? Up here in our balanced chemical equation. For every one mole of methane, coefficient of one out here, the ones are understood, that's why we don't put a one here. If it's in the equation, there's at least one. So one mole of methane, one mole of carbon dioxide. So there's our relationship. We want the mole of methane in the denominator, and we want the mole of carbon dioxide in the numerator. All right, last step. We want to convert from moles of carbon dioxide to grams of carbon dioxide. How much does a mole of carbon, what's the mole, this is the way we would say it. What is the molar mass of carbon dioxide? How much? 44.0 is correct. How'd you get that? Okay, so two oxygens at 16 is 32, and then 12 for the carbon. That's 44. You're right. 44.0 grams. All right. Again, how do we get this? We have to look at the carbon, look at the two oxygens, masses on the periodic table, add those together for one mole. All right, so now we're ready to get our calculator out and calculate this out. It's 101 divided by 16.01, and then it's 1 to 1, so we're not going to worry about that. Multiply by 44, and you get 277 grams of carbon dioxide. Well, 278 if you round it to three significant figures. 278 grams. Now, what this does is it proves to you how bad global warming can be. You only burn one mole of methane that weighs 16 grams per mole. And we're getting 278 grams of carbon dioxide out of it. So it's not very good. Get more carbon dioxide, getting a lot of carbon dioxide out of it. It is still one mole, but I mean, more, well, I mean, it's equivalent to one to one mole ratio, but it's a lot of carbon dioxide. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Did I make a mistake real quick? 101 divided by 16.01. Oh, there's, yeah, you see, I just talked right through it, didn't I? You caught it. Yeah. That's what it is. I said 01, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, 276 is right. 276. Because I said. All right, so that's where we'll stop today. On Thursday, what I will tell you to do is work the first chapter towards you can, and we'll do more of this on uh, Thursday. But I wanted to get through this because this is what the main focus of uh, chapter 4 is. And I will, I think I've saved this. I think that it's going to be uh, recording my voice too. So I will post this on YouTube later today. So if you need, need some help. Uh,